the Mediterranean. Destination of wildlife filmmaker Thomas Behrendt and home to animals you wouldn't expect to find here. An exciting quest for the biggest and the rarest sea mammals. The expedition will travel from the craggy coastline of Greece to the steep cliffs of West Africa. With a team of top experts in sea mammals, Thomas Behrendt is on his way along the cliffy coast of Greece. The German spends much of his life at sea, but this journey is unusual. He is on the trail of a giant and a phantom. Six million years ago, the Mediterranean was still dry. It wasn't until it became a sea that marine animals moved into it from the Atlantic via the Straits of Gibraltar. One of these ancient travelers appears, a female loggerhead turtle on her way to the beach where she was born. The research vessel Nereus on board, Thomas Behrendt and Greece's leading expert on sperm whales, Alexandros Francis. Their goal is to document the secret life of these Mediterranean giants. You know, almost everybody I told about going to the Mediterranean to see sperm whales was laughing about me. And, but they are here, aren't they? Yes, of course they are. And we get the same reaction when we say that we are studying sperm whales in the Mediterranean. But if I look to the, the Mediterranean, which is comparably shallow and small, mm -hmm. can it really host sperm whales? Uh, yes, of course it can, because the Mediterranean is not so shallow. We are very close to the deepest point of the Mediterranean, which is uh, 5,125 meters. It's a lot. And all along the Hellenic Trench, this is what we find. The most important for the sperm whales, it's not the depth, it's the steep uh, slope at the end of the continental shelf. This is important for them. We will go all along the Hellenic Trench and hopefully uh, I'm practically uh, certain that we will find sperm whales. Let's go. <laughs> okay, let's go. It doesn't take long to find the first signs of life. The expedition encounters the most common sea mammals of the Mediterranean, a school of dolphins, including calves. Although baby dolphins are suckled by their mothers for the first year, they have to swim with a pod as soon as they are born. But the team isn't here to play with dolphins. They want to track down whales. For this purpose, a hydrophone is being prepared. What is the reason that the, the sperm whales uh, do this clicking? Well, they produce clicks because they, this is the way they can see their environment. They send these clicks, and from the echo, they can receive information about the distance of any ob object. So this is the way they navigate, they find their boots, they understand that there are enemies around, etc. Mm -hmm. And our chance to find them. Exactly, <laughs> from these clicks. The hydrophone, basically a hose containing two microphones, trails in the water 100 meters off the stern. But today, the gods seem to be against them. Alexandros is steering a zigzag course, constantly veering this way and that. Alexandros, uh, why did we move like this? Is there any reason? We have this search pattern here. Oh yes, today it wasn't, it wasn't easy. And this is because we heard them ahead. But ahead means 
at almost 180 degrees ahead of the boat. So we don't know if they are really ahead at the left or at the right. And we should check all these possibilities. And any sperm whale clicks? But, but I, yes, uh, I, I just start hearing some faint clicks far away. Mm -hmm. Yes, definitely. We have sperm whales ahead. Alexandros instructs the crew to keep their eyes open. Spotting whale spouts on such a vast expanse of water takes a lot of experience. Blow ahead, two whales appear at the surface. Sperm whales? They jumped up over. It's the filmmaker's lucky day. Just two hours on the sea and yeah, yeah, yeah. the sperm really whale. Like... Oh, do you think we can try to go in the water with them? Yeah. If this goes on for a few more minutes, it could be a nice opportunity to, to try a first dive. Alexandros won't permit diving until the whales have got used to the boat. You can start preparing. It's yes, the perfect moment. Moment. But the animals are just not cooperating and disappear. Are the whales close again? If the tail fin appears, the whale is hunting for squid. It won't turn up for another half hour. And where exactly, only the whale knows. But they go down. They don't like it. The next opportunity. But behind Thomas's back, the whales are doing as they please. Oh no! They dive again, huh? That's it. Okay. Too late. An everyday story for a wildlife filmmaker. Some days later, the craggy coastline of Greece. Stretching over thousands of kilometers, it's the ideal habitat for the monk seal. So rare, it could almost be described as a phantom. Thomas hopes to find the animal with the help of Vasidis Karutos, the Greek leading expert on monk seals. But it's a game of luck, especially in the spring. The best chances are in autumn during late September, October, November, because at that time, the mothers give birth to their pups, and as they are really good mothers and they have to stay with their pups, they spend much time inside their shelters uh, nursing the pups, so we have many more chances to see them than now. And if I would go into the water right now, and do I have any chance to film? No to chances, no chances. It's like uh, a needle in a, in a barn. Thomas and Vasilis are traveling to the Alonisus National Maritime Park, the only one in Greek waters designated for the protection of monk seals. They want to install a remote-controlled camera in a cave visited periodically by seals. The men chose springtime, as this is the season where the caves are usually free of seals. Nevertheless, they proceed cautiously. A sudden movement grabs Thomas's attention. He makes a surprising discovery. A male monk seal has taken shelter in the cave, but why? Vasilis is worried and looks for clues in the seal's behavior. So as not to disturb the seal, the men decide to wait some distance away. The caves are the seal's last refuge, but weren't their original habitat. 
In the old times, they were giving birth to open beaches. Uh, but now, due to the change of the habitat, because they were pushed, let's say, from the human disturbance to change their way of life, now they give birth to inside caves, which are very unsafe, unsuitable for the babies. Because in case of stormy weather, then the waves are crashing into the, the caves and the baby might drown. But if it was born on a beach, then in case of stormy weather, as you understand, it would just go further up to the beach and no harm, nothing, it will be safe. The next morning begins with a dive into the fascinating world inhabited by the seals. Thomas soon finds the entrance to a cave. It's a dark world, but full of life. Caverns like these are favorite resting spots for monk seals, but the only animals the filmer discovers are sponges and anemones. A slipper lobster hides in the darkness, a delicacy for humans and monk seals alike. The beam of Thomas's torch picks out shrimp clustered together at the far end of the cave. A forked hake seizes its chance. The cave is home to all kinds of creatures but no monk seals. This inhabitant of the sea is certainly no friend of seals. Octopuses are rarely seen in daylight, preferring the safety of the night, with good reason. They can change their color to match the background. Studies show that today around half of monk seals' diet consists of octopus. Fish, the normal diet of seals, is hard to find because the Mediterranean has been practically fished to death. As the octopus settles almost directly on top of Thomas's camera, it's evident that some of its arms are damaged. It may well already have experienced an unpleasant encounter with a monk seal. At sunset, the expedition leaves the island to spend the night in a small port. Idyllic appearances can be deceptive. Overfishing in the Mediterranean is threatening wildlife and local fishermen. Many species are being driven towards extinction. But there is still hope. New life will emerge tonight. The new arrivals are loggerhead turtles. A dangerous journey awaits the tiny amphibians. Even those who survive will not all reach adulthood. But the females who make it will return to lay their eggs on the beach where they were born. After the run of bad luck with the sperm whales, Thomas and Alexandros decide to try a different whale territory. They travel on to Crete. Greece's largest island is a windy place. Meltemi, the summer wind, sweeps through the Aegean from June to September and is responsible for Crete's blue skies. Some days it brings force eight winds and a rough sea.
For the next few days, the crew is stuck in port. For Thomas, the situation is frustrating. Time is slowly running out. With each day that passes, the chances of Thomas getting any sperm well or monk seal footage at all are growing slimmer. And each new day puts ever greater demands on his creativity. To reality. Giant squid is the favorite food of sperm whales, but the sea around Greece is too salty for them. So what are these whales hunting? Thomas hopes to find the answer at the local fish market. Much of the fish here is flown in from Africa. The overfished Mediterranean can no longer meet the needs of the many tourists. It takes Thomas a while to find what he's looking for. Not exactly plentiful. A sperm whale needs between 500 and 1,000 kilos of squid a day. Eventually, the weather improves, and Thomas can return to the Nereus. Hi, Thomas. <laughs> Good to see you again. How are you? Welcome back. <laughs> fine, fine. And you? Fine. I'm fine. Everything good on the boat? Yes, of course. So let's have some sperm whales, huh? Okay. <laughs> Will the team be any more successful this time? Alexandros has been on research trips during which he didn't see a sperm whale for three weeks. Today, however, luck is on their side, and they encounter their first group of whales in the morning. This time, the whales are more trusting. They don't flee and even show an interest in the ship. Alexandros can get some pictures. These seem to be old acquaintances. Yeah. Ah, I think this is Pilos group. If this is Pilos group, it's the best known. Studies show that Mediterranean whales never cross into the larger Atlantic Ocean. The small population seems to live in total isolation. The crystal clear water allows the whales to be identified even at some depth. The adults are about 10 meters long. Almost the whole group has dived leaving only two whales on the surface. And these are a calf and a juvenile, probably, these two whales, waiting at surface for the, for mother, the mother to return. But the baby will, be, will never be left alone, is that right? Uh, well, it depends. It happens when we are for many hours with the whales and they are uh, adapted to our presence. They leave sometimes the, the baby close to the boat and they go die. Do they leave it and, and, and they, they are not afraid? They trust us, actually. Ah, yes, okay. yes. Mm -hmm. A major cause for the recent decline in sperm whales, they get entangled in high sea drift nets used for catching swordfish. Recovery is slow, especially for the small population in the Mediterranean. Why do they try to stick out their head? How oh, they are inspecting the boat? It's the only position where they can see stereoscopically with both eyes. They have 3D vision. Because of the big head, in all other directions, they can see either with one or with the other eye. So when they want to inspect something better, they stay like this and they look ah, okay. towards the lower jaw. Okay. Right. 
for the first time on the expedition, the whales are not preoccupied with hunting. They've come together for a rare meeting, an ideal opportunity for Thomas to get some unique footage. Okay, be ready. Go. Diving among these gigantic creatures is a humbling experience. Thomas approaches them with respect. The animals are enormous and much, much faster than a diver. It would be the easiest thing in the world if they wanted to attack him. The whales turn to the camera and inspect the alien visitor. For Thomas, it's a strange feeling. He wonders what the whales think of him. And will they just keep watching him, or is there going to be some other reaction? Then the giants bunch up close together. The behavior of whales is mysterious. Thomas doesn't know what they are communicating about. But he knows that in large males, one third of the body length is used to produce sounds that pass through the huge nose, the world's largest biological sound generator. Still, very little is known about the way whales communicate. Just before the end of the dive, one of the whales below the filmer accelerates and his bulky body shoots out of the water. Yoo-hoo! Thomas's patience has paid off. He's finally got some very unusual footage. What he doesn't know is that the most exciting moment of his career as an underwater filmmaker still lies before him. A few days later, Thomas and Vasilis return to the cave where they saw the injured seal. There's no sign of it. Hoping it's made a recovery, they try to find a place for the remote camera. So, where do you think the, the mother will be? The, this rock you see over here, as we have high tide now and this is submerged, the rock. Yeah. In September, October, it will be out of the water. So this area from over there, all the way you till down the, the to there, it will be a space for the pups to lie down outside of the water. Uh -huh. And the mothers will lie down around here. And some of them, if they want to get to go to a dark place, then they can use, you see it goes the tunnel, goes a bit further up. Uh -huh. And then they can use this place and, but to they, rest. Do you think they, do they hide inside here? Or? No, they, they, they like to put their head into the darkest place of the ah, cave. Okay. You have to always to keep in mind that during the <laughs> storm, here things are much, much different. Oh, it's not easy. Finally, they find a sheltered spot, a slanting rock face behind the cave entrance. The installation takes place in stages. First comes the noisy part. Vasilis has told Thomas that really big waves smash against the rocks and spray sweeps all over the cave. Okay. If seawater gets on the lens and dries, the salt crystals will prevent the camera from capturing anything at all. Okay. An aluminium plate serves as a mount. Then he installs the camera. It can be moved in any direction and includes an infrared function, 
enabling footage to be shot even in complete darkness. Later, no one will be allowed to enter the cave, so all the control and recording equipment has to be located outside. A bold venture. The cliffs above the cave rise almost vertically. Free climbing is not necessarily a filmmaker's dream. But the only reasonably flat surface to mount the solar panel for the power supply is a small plateau high above sea level. Finally, all the technical equipment has been hauled up and is ready to be installed. Without this technology, the crew would have to camp out by the cave for weeks. And the seals might get a scent of the humans, which would scare them off. A specially programmed computer can store the pictures for several days. Thanks to the internet, the footage can also be sent anywhere in the world. As soon as there is any activity in the cave, Thomas will return. A seal has been spotted off a neighboring island by a local fisherman. With patience and a bit of luck, Thomas might be able to find it. It's a game of hide and seek along the rocky seabed. Suddenly, there's a shadow. The phantom appears. his first monk seal, an adult male. Thomas scarcely dares to breathe. Should he follow the seal? It doesn't seem to feel threatened. What an opportunity. This is the footage he has so longed to get. It seems to be completely relaxed. But what do the sounds mean? The clearly audible clicking puzzles Thomas, who's never heard of such behavior. Curious, the seal approaches. A few minutes later, it disappears from Thomas's sight. Not wanting to disturb the animal, the filmmaker decides to return to the boat. Back in port, he can't wait to hear Vasilis's opinion. Well. That's very strange. So why, uh, why, why did he do that? I don't really know. You had uh, recorded something <laughs> that uh, most probably it's the first time that somebody records something like that. Showing this, off, this is, is calling it, something, so maybe mating. It's not a, a hostile behavior, that's for, for sure. A new puzzle for us. <laughs> it's, it's, I'm very glad to, to, yeah, to hear yeah. this. New puzzle for us. The behavior of monk seals still holds secrets, even for Vasilis. Back on Alexandros's boat, the Mediterranean is a busy place, especially if you work with a hydrophone. It's too noisy, too much noise. You hear the propellers? And this is all from this tanker ship there? Yeah, yeah, just from this boat. And you see where it is over there. 
sperm whales are becoming deaf. And the problem is that the collisions of vessels with sperm whales is increasing rapidly. Look here. Ugh. All these are uh, sperm whales. You, you can see the propeller marks. This they are the huge. Propellers? Yeah, yeah. It, yeah all, actually, yeah. almost the entire sperm whale is cut in pieces. You can imagine if you have a population of just 200 animals and uh, more than one per year is disappearing by a purely anthropogenic cause, then the impact to the population is, is big. It's probably not sustainable. In spite of the ship's propeller sounds, Alexandros locates sperm whales ahead. They should appear. They stopped clicking, so they should appear at surface at any moment. We have to be careful. Low, low, over there. But this time, something is different. Low, eight whales. They are, they are really speeding. Entire group traveling so fast. We don't understand why. Then the whales suddenly stop. A few position themselves vertically in the water. It looks as though the females are holding another of their meetings. As yet, nobody knows that their behavior has a very different reason. Thomas, it may be nice. Prepare yourself. When you are ready, you let me know. Thomas can't make out what's going on under the surface and thus has no idea what awaits him. In a hurry, he prepares for diving. You can go. The moment the filmmaker has waited for for weeks. The whales have never been so close to the boat and in such numbers. But the giants are busy. The last thing they seem to need at the moment is a paparazzo. Thomas has no clue what's going on. Unnoticed amongst the mass of gigantic gray bodies, a baby sperm whale has been born. Curious, it heads straight for the camera. Mother and aunt do not approve and begin to threaten the intruder. The females have to keep the calf near the surface so that it can breathe, and they have to deal with what may be an enemy. An aunt joins the mother. Her message is clear. Back off. The situation gets out of control. Come on the boat, quickly! Thomas swims as fast as he can. But the whales are in hot pursuit of the cameraman. Barely a meter behind, the giants chase him. If they wanted to, the whales could easily deliver a fatal bite. As the crew pulls Thomas out of the water, his camera keeps running. He is confused because it was a really nasty situation. Thomas says that one of the whales already had its teeth around his leg. Can you see the newborn that has the fin? Yes, yes, yes. In the middle, they are protecting it. Yeah. The whales didn't want to hurt Thomas. They just wanted to protect their new family member. 
Thomas never intended to disturb the whales. But after all the commotion, it was a lucky day for the expedition and the whales. For Alexandros, this is a first. After 10 years spent studying whales, a dream has come true. Thomas is overwhelmed. As all young animals, the baby whale is very curious. It really looks for support, huh, Alexandros? Yeah, yeah. The newborn calf weighs about a ton and is four meters long. It spent more than a year in its mother's womb and will take another year or two suckling before it can feed itself. Thank you very much for this Thomas, opportunity. It was really, it's really amazing. <laughs> How is it for you? I mean, you've seen so many sperm whales. Oh, this is something unbelievable. Two years ago, yes. the same social yes. unit one gave one. a newborn, but it was one day old. And now it's one hour old, or perhaps 10 minutes old. That's why they were running to gather, but because they understood yeah, yeah. one of them was going to give birth. Thomas! Thank you so oh. much. Was, I, that was the most um, oh, uh, exciting experience I ever had in my life. Yeah. The crew will soon take their leave of the whales. The turbulent events they've experienced in their search for the grey giants have forged strong bonds among the team members. They're bringing back pictures that have never been seen before, and the newborn calf gives them hope that, despite the constant threats, the giants of the Mediterranean have a chance to survive. the chances that uh, the newborn is surviving. Here in the Mediterranean, in Greece, they have, I think, they have much more chances because there are much less predators. Of course, there are other risks from humans. And uh, of course, the mother has to, to dive to find squid in order to have meal. But if a mother, the mother has a problem, another female adult will take care. This is why they have the social unit, because the social unit protects all the members of the group. The whales may have a future, but what about the seals? A few hundred years ago, monk seals would have been an everyday sight in the Mediterranean. They inhabited almost every coastline. Today, a few animals live off the coasts of Greece and Turkey. Other than that, there is only one major area they can be found the Western Sahara. What chances of survival do the monk seals of the Atlantic coast have? Before the birthing season begins in the Mediterranean, Thomas travels to West Africa. Western Sahara is a land of extremes one of the places in the world most richly endowed with marine life hits upon an inhospitable desert. Since the 1990s, Spanish scientists have been conducting a successful program to protect monk seals. When the seals aren't hunting, they spend a lot of time playing in the surf. Close by, a mother and her pup, something Thomas would never see anywhere else. Today, the camera mounted in the birthing cave needs a service. Upsiling down is an absolute exception. Even if the seals don't seem bothered, the scientists won't go any further.
The interior of the cave is an extremely sensitive area. One glance inside reveals why. The beach offers the animals peace and shelter. Directly above the cave is the observation station. The scientists watch events in the cave on a daily basis. The camera also allows them to identify different animals, valuable data for the scientists. Now, in October, all eyes are on the newborn pups, and there's good news. 50 pups were born this year, more than at any time in the last 12 years. It seems that the population here is growing again, a hopeful sign for the colony. A strip of coastline, six kilometers in length, is home to about 200 seals, half as many as in the entire Mediterranean. In the evening, Thomas checks his emails and is in for another surprise. This is unbelievable. It's working, you know, and we have the baby. Very nice. The cave camera in Greece shows a mother seal with her newborn pup. Thomas decides to return to the Mediterranean at once. But the weather in Greece has changed dramatically. The fall storms have begun. The pictures from the cave are disturbing. Did the pup manage to find shelter in the furthest corner of the cave? Or has something terrible happened? As soon as the storm dies down, Thomas and Vasilis hurry to the cave. No, there's nothing, and there's still a big swell. Vasilis is worried and keeps on searching. She knows, the mother knows, that it's much more safe for the animal. Now let's try and see if we can move here. Vasilis is still hopeful that the mother has taken her young one to another cave. If the pup is injured, the men have to find it as quickly as possible. The two men are extremely cautious. The last thing they want is to disturb the mother, because she might then abandon her pup. Thomas and Vasilis look in a dozen caves, both above and below the surface, always with the same sobering result, nothing. Even though they're getting further and further away from the birthing cave, they're not about to give up. It's not until they go to an island outside the national park that Vasilis finds a sign of life. There is a track that leads all the way up, and it smells. That means they slept, the animal was sleeping here yesterday. Then, at last, Vasilis finds the missing seal. It seems to be fine and shows no signs of injury. Vasilis takes a quick hair sample for genetic tests. The pup doesn't feel a thing. Then Vasilis leaves as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. 
but the young one decides to follow him. A golden opportunity for the filmmaker. As long as the mother is away, Vasilis gives him permission to dive. Maybe the baby seal will take to the water. The newborn is still on the beach. A seal, not the pup, but another young animal, a few months old. It was probably here when they arrived. Caves are often used by more than one mother seal. This allows for better protection for the young when the adults are off hunting. And then the pup appears. Unlike adults, the young are extremely curious. Playfully, they explore their surroundings, at the same time steadily increasing the length of time they can stay underwater. Scientists estimate that there are only between 250 and 300 monk seals left in Greek waters. Thus, encounters such as these are a rare delight. The pup is still young, and its mother will only leave it for an hour or two to go hunting. In a few weeks, it will be left to fend for itself for up to half a day at a time. What fantastic footage. Better than Thomas could have hoped for. The young male will grow to a length of about two and a half meters and weigh roughly 300 kilos. The female will be a little shorter and lighter. Finally, it's time to leave. That's really stunning. Good, eh? Yeah. <laughs> really, really good. Perfect. But they, they swam between us. It's incredible. Yeah, yeah. And they are not afraid about it? Uh, he was, uh, it seems that he was used in our appearance. And he was not afraid. You see, he was really accustomed to our uh, presence there. So that was uh, great. <sighs> good, good. No Thank disturbance, <laughs> nothing. <laughs> This is an experience neither man will ever forget. Back on board, Vasilis' elation gives way to thoughtfulness. Just on their book, as a lost memory, let's say. What do you think will be the, the future of the man seal? With one word I can say, not promising. There are so many things that has to be done. If I have to compare these two periods of my life and my involvement with the monk seals, I'm, I'm very disappointed because the population since 1980 has declined. What are the things we have to do? We have to do more marine protected areas, more no-take zones with corridors between them which will be connected in order also to increase the fish stock, the food for the animal, but also to apply more measurements, regulations of the human activities which is actually the main cause for the, which threats the survival of this animal. So, and if we don't do that, then they, they might extinct? Do you think that's possible? Yes, if we keep going what we do today, which is not enough, yes, they will extinct. On the one hand, the expeditions were a great success for both scientists and filmmaker. On the other hand, they show there's still a lot to be done to save the giant and the phantom of the Mediterranean.